Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 54, I chat with Fred Bargetzi, Vice President of Technology at Crestron, and Josh Steen, Director of Product Management, about distributing and controlling audio and video throughout the home. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, episode 54, recorded February 14th, 2011. In Control with Crestron. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheater.com. This week's guest geeks are Fred Bargetzi, the Vice President of Technology at Crestron, and Josh Steen, Director of Product Management, both at Crestron Electronics. Hey, Fred and Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, Scott, how, how are, are you doing? Scott? Good to see you. Yeah, there's Josh, there's, uh, there's Josh, and uh, Fred hey, is uh, right there both in uh, a lovely uh, area of Crestron. Is that the Experience Center there? It is indeed. You guys have a, uh, a whole training facility, I believe, there uh, on the East Coast where dealers and uh, others can come and learn about Crestron products and, and uh, actually put their hands on them, right? That's right. We're actually in our experience center, but uh, we actually have this replicated in 13 offices around the country and then another 20 or so around the world. Wow. Wow. Well, that's very cool. We're going to get into a lot of what Crestron does, starting with a bit of history. Crestron started over 40 years ago, I think, uh, as a company making slide projector controllers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, we actually have some humble roots uh, started by a gentleman named George Feldstein. He's still our president and CEO. And uh, yeah, he started out making some, uh, doing contract manufacturing and engineering, uh, went into slide projector controls, and it, it kind of took off from there into the world of AV. Yeah. Uh, you told me offline that it was all, you also were an early player in the ATM machine business? <laughs> Yeah, we actually made some of the first Citibank um, deposit machines, uh, which was really the precursor to the automatic teller um, you know, devices that you see today. Wow. And on top of that, we even made things as esoteric as uh, digital jewelry scales, some of the first. Whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yep. You, are you still into any of that business or is it now strictly audio video? No, no, it's definitely matured and we have our hands full today making all we can uh, for AV and environmental control and all sorts of other good stuff. Right. Well, we're going to get way into audio video control and distribution. And I want to make sure everybody logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv or the live video stream at live.twit.tv knows that they can post questions for uh, Fred and Josh. And uh, I'll pass on as many as I can as we go along. So um, when did Crestron get involved with audio video content and distribution? Um, I'm looking at Josh here. Both uh, I've been here for 20 years. Josh has been here for 10. And uh, I think it was actually in the late 90s, really, you know, if you want to talk about um, residential home control. And that's really when we started to get into audio distribution when it became big, probably 96, 98 or so. Right, yeah, Josh? somewhere around there. But you'd been doing control, like home automation and control type things before that, right? Absolutely. Um, although, you know, when I started back in 1990, control was really limited to the boardroom. Um, there were a few home installations that were going on back then. As a matter of fact, I remember one of the first jobs that I was on was uh, for Norman Lear, uh, the producer at of his all home? the family. And, yeah, at his house. <laughs> oh, and wow. uh, it was actually back in 1990, so I guess we have been doing it for some time. And uh, it was a lot less sophisticated back in those days. We were actually running the big 35 millimeter uh, film projectors, doing some basic lighting and things like that. And uh, that was really probably some of the early starts of, of home automation. But it was for hmm. definitely the super wealthy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I have to say that your that Crestron still sort of has the reputation for being uh, for the wealthy. That is, you know, you the the products that you offer and the systems that you provide are uh, relatively expensive. Is that still true? I mean, I, it's I'm sure it must be still true. But uh, have you gone down market at all? 
Well, historically, that that definitely um, you know, there is some truth to that. Uh, you know, the systems are very complicated and have been very complicated, especially many years ago. Um, but we've seen that dynamic change quite a bit recently, especially over the last year or two, uh, where we've actually introduced whole new uh, product lines that are dedicated to um, people that are a little more budget conscious, but they still want similar performance. For instance, we have a, a Prodigy line of products that is is geared toward control, audio distribution, theater systems for that more budget-minded uh, individual. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we'll talk about a little bit more detail about that system uh, a little bit later, uh, but I wanted to ask uh, if any of this, any of your products are, uh, shall I say, DIY, or does it really require a, a, an installer to put it together? As you mentioned, it's a very complex kind of system, uh, so I would imagine that in most cases anyway, you'd really want an installer to, in, to put it in and set it up and program it and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Today we're still geared towards the value-added integrator or the installer. Um, just because most of the systems that we um, find are being installed today include lighting, security, and uh, HVAC. And those are things that uh, typical DIYers don't, don't want to get involved with. Right. <laughs> exactly. High voltage already... and uh, do-it-yourself doesn't always mix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've already got a uh, question in the chat room that, that anticipates something that I was going to ask anyway. Do you sell uh, equipment that does video over UTP, which I only recently learned means un unshielded twisted pair? Ah, so that's a good question. Um, actually, for the past 12 years, we've been doing video distribution over unshielded twisted pair. Um, although uh, up until a few years ago, this, which the system was very successful, what we were doing was composite S or component video along with SP diff over UTP. And uh, oh gosh, we probably sold 50,000 plus systems. Oh, easily. Today. It was it was um, extremely popular line of products because it uh, it was really the first method to use a single cable to get all those uh, those video and audio signals around the house in, a, in an analog domain. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and was not it, only did that, you, it, sorry? So, sorry, go ahead. Um, include, not only uh, did it do video, but it also did control. And that's why it was really unique because, um, you know, once you get the, the audio and the video out to the display, you actually have to control the display as well. And so that's why the system, I think, was so successful, but is because it incorporated all the elements that you needed for a truly integrated audio video distribution system. Now, did I hear you say that it, it distributed component video? It did good old-fashioned component video. I know you don't but hear that, about that much these days. Well, you don't. Even less composite, which you also mentioned. Or was it S-video? Uh, uh, it did was, composite S and component. Wow. Component normally needs three cables. How did you uh, multiplex those onto a single cable? Uh, the beauty of uh, unshielded twisted pairs is it's yeah. got four pairs. So three pairs were used for the component signal. And then on the fourth pair, we'd actually send digital audio or SP diff down to the destination. Mm. Um, <laughs> I've got another question in the chat room here right away. Um, asking for you to tell the story of your, quote, most Mac Daddy install. I assume that means like <laughs> the biggest, most massive <laughs> most complex <laughs> <laughs> there, there's just there's just so many amazing installations that, that are uh, that our integrators have done over the years I mean just uh, yeah just I'll, I'll name one that's just a little unusual I remember one of the last jobs that I was uh, when I was working down in our Florida office and um, you know kind of consulting on uh, on a design was actually for a, a large mega yacht and this uh, this boat had uh, at the time using that that older uh, analog distribution system over UTP had over seventy zones of video distribution on the boat. On a boat. Um, yeah, on a boat. So it, it was a, it was a pretty big installation. And and the homes then obviously if you use that as your 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 benchmark, the homes just go uh, uh, up in, in scale and grandeur from there. Yeah, oh, yeah, one of the last homes that I was at up in Canada was a little 60,000 square foot residence. Oh, and, a little cabin. Uh, a log cabin yeah. in the woods. Oh, huh? Yeah, exactly. I think it took about an hour and a half to walk through at a brisk pace uh, just to go see all the rooms. So, um, yeah. the, you know, the sky's the limit uh, with most of these things. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And now, of course, though, th that was, uh, Josh, you were mentioning this big super yacht uh, being in one of these analog systems. Now, of course, I'm sure you're, more focused on digital distribution. How does that differ from the analog systems of the past? Well, um, we, we can both uh, answer to that, but uh, 
the uh, the complexity um, goes up dramatically. Um, you, know, you start dealing with the, the digital signals, um, the bandwidth goes up, um, you know, exponentially. Uh, the complexity because of things like HTCP, the, the key encryption um, for content protection, adds additional layers on top of that um, that uh, make distributing signals out across a home or a mega yacht or whatever uh, whatever the installation is uh, is just it's a lot more difficult um, but the benefit is is great because you have a higher definition signal now you're talking about multi-channel audio multi-channel high definition audio you're talking about control you're talking about uh, things like uh, USB for transport of, of Xbox controllers and things like that so you can really centralize all of your componentry uh, uh, in, in, a, in a rack room and uh, not have all the clutter in each of the individual rooms around the house. Mm -hmm. And what kind of bandwidth uh, do, do these systems require? I mean, um, it must it, be pretty it's, immense. It's pretty nasty. Um, you know, if, you look at, <laughs> if you look at what composite video was, um, you know, in comparison to HDMI, I mean, today to do HDMI deep color, which of course, if you're going to do a a high-end system, you've got to have deep color. You're looking at uh, anywhere from, you know, 50 megahertz from some of the old stuff, right, all the way up to 1.1 gigahertz for uncompressed deep color HDMI. And, uh, you know, when you're in the gigahertz range, you're talking about, um, you know, signals that need to be carefully handled and distributing them, distributing them over long distances is definitely a challenge. So uh, it really can't be handled lightly. It's not something that um, can be done typically on traditional cabling, and uh, although technology is evolving tremendously, um, we started actually development on a product line, we call it digital media, about three and a half years ago. And uh, the concept behind this whole thing was to not only take any analog video source that you might have in your home, but we also, of course, wanted to be able to handle all the digital video sources like DVI or HDMI, or maybe even HDSDI, depending upon the installation. And, um, you know, back when we started this whole thing, our whole concept was, wouldn't it be great if we could just stream everything? It would just make things a heck of a lot easier. You could run your Ethernet network throughout the house and life would be pretty good. But the problem was the technology really just wasn't there at the time. Uh, to take in a, a, an uncompressed HDMI signal and stream it throughout the house. The, the cost of the endpoints was tremendous. Uh, the horsepower that you needed to do that was significant. And uh, it really just wasn't something that could be accomplished. But um, fortunately, through some other alternative technology that we had, we, uh, we were able to introduce this product line. Uh, and send these high definition signals uncompressed over shielded twisted pair throughout the house. Yeah, so, so you're not using really. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Josh, please. So the challenge is really taking that 1.1 gigahertz signal and then fitting it on that, S, uh, that shielded twisted pair that's running at about 250 megahertz. And that's really the, 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 the technology behind digital media, the magic behind it. Um, and that's what we've achieved and uh, to great success on, on, on the product line. So you're not using the, the home's already existing local area network. You're, you're actually having to install a separate set of wires to do this, right? That's correct. Um, the problem with most typical home installations, at least today, is if you look at a cable box or a satellite receiver, is that you don't get to touch the content in its compressed digital format. You're, you're, uh, in the compressed digital format, you can certainly stream it. You can get a nice high-definition stream um, at about 50 megabits per second if you have a dedicated pipeline. But um, because we can't touch that cable content or the satellite box or the cable TV content, I should say it's coming out in HDMI, um, you're looking at full, unbroken bridled, uncompressed, high-definition video, which, uh, you know, is running at 1.1 gigahertz in deep color. And uh, there's no Ethernet network that I know of today that can handle 1.1 gigahertz uh, bandwidth because that is, I mean, when you talk about a gigahertz uh, or gigabit Ethernet network, I mean, that doesn't include retransmissions and all the other good stuff that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to be able to send 1.1 gigahertz of video down a pipeline, you need some serious uh, cabling and, and transmission infrastructure. And, and nobody wants to sit there and deal with buffering problems and things like that that you, you can sometimes experience with, with streaming content. They want to they wanna have it like their cable box or their Blu-ray players plugged directly via an HDMI cable two feet away from their display. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. From what you're saying, it sounds to me like wireless uh, would not even be an option in, in, a, in a big Crestron system like this. 
Uh, you know, we've evaluated a number of technologies, and we work with um, all the all the leading chipset manufacturers today. Um, there is some really good wireless technology that's starting to hit the market. Uh, the problem is that it's still relatively limited in distance. The the bandwidth is is high, even if you um, you know certainly if you send it uncompressed, you're still in the gigahertz range. If you compress it, then you're of course going to lose some quality, and that's one of the big um, you know uh, untold secrets with wireless technology today is that they don't realize that you're actually compressing it. Not only that, when you compress video and you stream it, uh, you run into a challenge with surround sound processing. So I'll give you a good example. Imagine if you had a cable box going into a surround sound receiver so you can get your full surround sound audio, uh, and then you take the output of that surround sound receiver to a streaming device to go up to your display. The problem is, is that when you're streaming it, you're going to compress it, you're going to add latency to it, and uh, you know sometimes it could be two to four seconds of latency, which oh, I don't know smoke. if yeah, I don't know any surround sound processor that can even compensate for that today. And not only can I not compensate for it, that latency is not a static thing. It's going to be a variable that changes back and forth. And so now you have to have a surround sound processor that's going to vary its, its, uh, its, its lip sync delay based on something that's, it, that is an unknown. Right, oh, so if you go man. to Comedy Central, which is like is low definition, the compression is a lot less and it will stream a lot quicker. But then when you go to one of the high definition channels, now it's a lot longer. So yeah. you really can't even uh, compensate for that. So for us, we've chosen not to go to wireless. Um, you know, that, that's just one of the many reasons. Um, you know, again, since we're selling through uh, a network of value-added installers, to be able to run some shielded twisted pair really isn't a big deal. Uh, and we also provide the option to go with fiber as well. So, so that was my next question. I was going to ask you about fiber. Obviously, you got plenty of bandwidth there. Absolutely. Yeah, fiber is really unlimited. Um, it's becoming a lot easier to terminate. As a matter of fact, in, in all our training courses, we teach our integrators how to terminate fiber. Uh, the cost is not that much more expensive than even yeah. running unshield, or shielded twisted pair. And so we're finding that that's an option that a lot of our folks are choosing. And, and early on, there was there was a lot of hesitance and fear in in a lot of the residential industry because uh, many of the many of the integrators hadn't been dealing with fiber all that often. And and once we went through and we started teaching in our courses how to terminate fiber, uh, show them the the proper tool sets and how everything goes together, we're seeing a, a great dynamic of people going over to fiber because of the benefits, like as you said, you have uh, an extreme amount of bandwidth, and and now uh, things like distance limitations really do go away. And when you're talking about 60,000 square foot houses, in many cases, um, uh, that is that is something to be concerned with. Are you are you okay with plastic fiber? Has plastic fiber gotten to the point where it can carry the kind of bandwidth you're looking at, or do you really need glass? That's a good question. I mean, it, it really de it really depends on the manufacturer. We've definitely seen some plastic fiber that is that has come out that has pretty high specifications. Uh, we do sell um, a. Uh, for our digital media solutions, we do sell um, fiber uh, with the Crestron name on it, which is is basically tested and certified to work uh, with those those high definition, high bandwidth signals. So we always suggest to utilize that because it's going to ensure your performance, both whether you're using the fiber or the copper solutions. Mm -hmm. But I will say there are some unique solutions. For example, uh, you know, a lot of people think of fiber running through the walls and all that good stuff. Um, you know, we actually have a very unique solution, which is uh, a fiber extender, which allows you to run HDMI, let's say, from your theater rack up to your display. And uh, the fiber actually looks like a piece of fishing line. So it's transparent. It's not in a jacket, and it's flexible. And the nice thing about that is I can literally run it up a wall, and you'd never see it. So there's a lot of advantages that fiber has today. And as Josh said, you know, the cost has come down. Uh, we even sell it pre-terminated to, to take the fear out of it. And so, we're, again, we're finding a lot of uh, people choosing the fiber option. I'm, I'm amazed that you can do fiber without a jacket. Um, don't, you get, don't you get some amount of light loss through it in, <laughs> under those conditions? Um, now it's it's the the outer portion is treated so that the light waves reflect back and it's uh, it's really quite spectacular. It's a really <laughs> elegant solution. Yeah, it's been it's been a good solution for for integrators because there's you know especially as things have started to transition over to deep color and the bandwidth uh, has increased so so significantly. They may have had an existing installation where they had a, a traditional HDMI cable between the rack and the projector. All of a sudden, you introduce deep color and the picture's black. Uh, the, you know, the cable wasn't capable of handling the bandwidth, and so now they have a nice solution where they can run this really uh, thin, easy-to-fish uh, uh, piece of fiber 
put the transmitter on one end, the receiver on the other end, and they've got, uh, they're, they're insured that they're going to get a, a good quality signal to the projector. Now, you guys have mentioned deep color a number of times, and I'd like to, first of all, define what it means for our listeners who might not know, which is uh, that the number of bits used to represent each color, red, green, and blue, is expanded, is increased from uh, 8 to, what's the number now, 24 as, as a maximum? 12. 12. 12 yep. bits per, co per yep. color, which does require a lot more bandwidth. However, I have a problem <laughs> with deep color in that uh, there are plenty of displays now that can display deep color, that can accept this new higher resolution um, uh, color representation, but there's no content that's that right. is mastered yep. in, that that you can get you can buy in any way. So what's the bit? Why why are you? Uh, but, what's yeah, the big deal with that? Herein lies the problem. If the display uh, is capable of of displaying deep color, um, part of the information that gets sent back and forth on the HDMI cable, the EDID information, basically says I'm a display and I can support uh, deep color. Uh, so what it does is basically everything downstream is going to transmit or transport that in that high, you know, that deep color format, even though the data on the line isn't actually um, there, the content, as you said, isn't physically there, but it is eating up the bandwidth. That, That's uh, interesting. So in other words, it's going gonna, it's gonna to transmit 12 bits, 8 bits of which are going to be the color information, and 4 bits of which are always going to be zero. But what, what you're saying is that the the display sends back this EDID, Extended Display Identification is what that stands for. Um, and, and so the device says, oh, okay, you can take deep color. I'm going to send you 12 bits per color, even though I only have 8 bits worth of information. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, I mean, that information, the, the difference between one display versus the other has, has been one of the difficulties in distributing HD content throughout a home or a, a corporation is that you have different displays that support deep color, non-deep color, different resolutions. And then if you're, if you're trying to send one source to multiple displays, uh, that creates a great hardship um, because what, what resolution do you pick? What, uh, well, you, not only that, the source doesn't know what to do. It gets confused, and typically what will happen is it will choose the least common denominator, and all of a sudden now you're going to get a, a lower-end uh, picture. You might drop down to 720p when you didn't really desire that. So um, as Josh was Good saying, is, you know, if I have a, um, maybe a display in my kitchen, for example, and you know if you get anything under, what is it, like uh, 19 inches today or 17 inches, it's all 720p, yeah. um, you know, it may drop down the signal resolution of that beautiful Blu-ray player that you really wanted to also see in your theater in the in the spectacular high definition and, and now you just don't get it and so HDMI has presented a ton of different challenges um, because there is a lot of data exchanged between the sources and the displays and right now the typical user is not aware of any of this and it was really designed to be intelligent but the problem is when you put it into the system level um, it really becomes uh, the opposite of that. So how do you how do you guys how does Crestron deal with this problem of uh, a 17-inch a TV in the kitchen and a big big screen in the home theater, and you're distributing the same signal to both. Can can you in fact get around this problem? Yeah, we actually have a, a number of different ways that we can get around the problem. Uh, one of the first things that we uh, we built into our digital media. Uh, 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 distribution solution was kind of a, a manager of, of all these EDID signals. So basically when the the integrator uh, goes and commissions the system, part of that is going to go up and define under what cases, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to go and I drop down to 720p or maybe I'm always going to maintain the 1080p signal. Um, so that's one of the things that they can they can do through our digital media solution and the software that goes along with it. Um, alternatively, uh, we can uh, insert uh, things like a, a, a high definition scaler at the, the end of uh, the line that even if I send a 1080p signal down to that uh, 19 inch display, it can actually bring it down to a 720p signal and maintain that 1080p integrity through the rest of the system. So there's a number of different ways that the solution will uh, actually uh, simplify um, this very complex scenario of multiple resolutions and deep color uh, and what have you, because in the end, that end user does not want to have to worry about, you know, can I send that signal to this display? They want to be able to do whatever they want to do when they mm -hmm. want to do it. Sure. 
Um, I've got a question in the chat room, a couple actually, and uh, the one I want to start with here is uh, there's somebody here who says he's actually thinking about putting a, a prodigy system into his house. So can you talk a little bit more about that particular system and what, what it can and can't do? Sure. So um, Prodigy was really designed to um, allow you to start up with Crestron, maybe uh, from a simple home theater control in a, in a family room or maybe even a dedicated room to do typical device control. So uh, control of your surround sound processor, DVD player, Blu-ray, um, amplifiers, whatever it might be, but then allow you to expand out into your home as you see your system growing. So part of the Prodigy line not only includes basic system control, but it also includes retrofit wireless lighting, thermostats, audio distribution, and uh, in the next 90 days or so, we're going to have a version of our digital media product line, which allows you to get HDMI distribution throughout the home as well. With, within the Prodigy, within the lower cost Prodigy uh, line, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the nice things today as, as technology advances is that there are so many consumer devices now which allow you to get into a system like this at a much more economical price. Uh, just a few years ago, you'd have to buy Crestron touch panels and dedicated interfaces. Today, with all the devices out there like iPads and Android devices and the software solutions that we have, it allows you to take advantage of the best of both worlds. So you can use some of our dedicated touch panels, maybe on the wall or some handheld remotes in your theater or in your bedroom. But then for some other uh, various places throughout the home, now you can take advantage of the iPad, whether it's within the home or maybe even something like an iPhone or an Android phone as you're out and mobile and on the road. Well, that certainly anticipates the next uh, um, chat room question from Evolve Home Media, who uh, wants to know about iPad and um, uh, iPhone type controllers. And uh, it brings me to the, to the part of, of my talking points that I wanted to talk about, which were various user interface options. You mentioned iPhone, iPad, Android, browsers. Uh, I think we have a picture of the uh, iPad, a couple of pictures actually of the iPad uh, in a couple of different configurations. Here, so uh, how long have you been working on that, and how does that help uh, integrate the entire uh, system and experience? Well, we actually started making network-based solutions back in 1997. Uh, our first installation was actually a commercial uh, installation, but it was the Cisco Home, and Cisco back uh, way back then. <laughs> was promoting the fact that you can network your home and we were doing control for it and we had something called e-control which allowed you on your web browser to launch your web browser and basically take control control of your home and emulate one of our touch panels and that has grown over the years as devices have progressed and um, you know today it's commonplace every system that we ship has a web server built into it so that you can have its own built-in UI and what we've done today is we've taken uh, a standard UI to leverage the power of an iPhone or an iPad uh, and we've also made that cross-platform uh, along with uh, the Android operating system. We have some, some partners out there who really capitalize this on this company called R2W out there. Um, and uh, there are just some amazing solutions now to leverage the power of uh, some of this technology. We saw there, a, really, moment ago, we saw there a moment ago a picture of the iPad, one of the iPad apps. I wanted to just make sure we didn't uh, gloss over that entirely. There it is. Uh, what are we looking at here? Well, exactly. this is I mean, an example iPad, of, you know, just one of the variations of uh, interface possibilities that you have. Um, as, you, as you look at a home or a home theater today, there's, there's just a, a myriad of different types of interfaces that you may want to use, and we need to make those available uh, to, to, the, to the end user. You know, for instance, if you're sitting down, you're watching, uh, watching television, uh, many times you don't want to be looking at an illuminated screen. Uh, you just want to be pressing hard tactile buttons on a remote control. And so we have to make remote controls that allow me to sit there and channel surf without having to look at a touch panel or, or something along those lines. This is, exactly, this is exactly my point about remotes often is I very much prefer hard button remotes over touchscreen remotes for that exact reason. And so I think yeah, we exactly. have a picture. And here's a picture of, a, of a, an iPad piece of hardware, a little, a little thing. Uh, describe this to us that, that gives us this. 
Yeah, so this is a, a perfect example. The iPad, as you, as you know, is a very, it's a very clean um, looking display. It's a touch panel display and there's a lot of benefits behind that touch panel. That's why we make touch panels today because you can, you can sort through lists and metadata and things along those lines. But as you were referring to, um, sometimes you just want some hard buttons for your most common features like volume up, volume down, you know, guide left, right, up, down, enter, those type of things. And so what we did is we actually took the iPad and we put a, a, basically like a case over the top of this product and added those hard buttons right on. So those buttons then communicate through the iPad, uh, back out through the wireless network, and uh, control your system. So now you get the best of both worlds. You get that nice iPad user display and the hard buttons that you want uh, when you're just trying to surf uh, through the channels. Uh, do you have anything like that either currently or in the works for an iPhone? Because the iPad is pretty big to, to be, you know, sitting on your lap or on your, on your couch or something. An iPhone would seem to me to be a little more, um, more like a regular remote control. Right. Well, you know, if you look at an iPhone today, uh, again, it, it's, it's pretty powerful. But, um, you know, if you're going to snap it into one of these remotes, uh, you know, I know I personally wouldn't be leaving my iPhone at home at, when I go to work for the kids to control the TV. So, uh, <laughs> True enough. Uh, the, uh, so really on that side of things, I think that we have a really nice selection of dedicated, um, you know, simple push button remotes to some very nice LCD displayed remotes that are price competitive with what it would take to take an iPhone and then snap on, you know, a and accoutrement to give you the, the hard button. Mm -hmm. So I think we have some good selections for that today. Right. Um, I got another question in the chat room. Um, any plans for distributed 4K? <laughs> <laughs> Never satisfied. No one's ever satisfied. Yes, that's, uh, that's definitely true. Uh, we, ultra, we, ultra def HD. We, we, we promise to continue to evolve the digital media product line to, uh, to keep up with technology and the, the various different resolutions and, and things like 3D, which uh, were brought online recently. So there's always going to be the next new thing. And that's uh, really what we pride ourselves here at Crestron is we, uh, we sink so much of our time, energy, and, and Mr. Feldstein uh, is great because he, he sinks a lot of, invests a lot of money back into the company for our R&D, and we will continue to develop uh, uh, digital media and other product lines to, uh, to, to, to take advantage of these new higher resolutions in both video or audio or whatever the next big thing is. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the uh, digital media system, uh, or DM, I guess you abbreviate it, and, and there's another piece of it that we haven't talked about yet that I want to make sure we do, which is called Sonex. Can you uh, describe how that interfaces with the DM system? Yeah, actually, it's it's uh, it's actually a separate product line, but it's designed to complement it. Um, ah, you know, the concept okay. behind DM or digital media was to take all your video sources, uh, including HDMI, and I think probably most folks listening on here know that HDMI includes audio now, uh, multi-channel audio, and distribute that throughout the home. But um, you know, in, in many homes, you might have a dedicated theater. But let's take, for example, uh, a kitchen. You know, in a kitchen, I'd like to have a, a nice display, and I'd like to have what we call, you know, what we refer to as traditional audio distribution where I might have some nice ceilings in my speaker and I can watch this really nice high definition display but I'd also like to have some better audio than what would come out normally the sides of the uh, speakers that are included with the display mm -hmm. and so if you want to do audio distribution in conjunction with video distribution, this is where the Sonex line comes into play. So the concept is, is that if you run your video source into our digital media product line, it will take in uncompressed high definition HDMI video along with multi-channel audio. And each one of our input cards in the digital media switcher has a digital signal processor or a surround sound processor. And here's where it gets interesting. We allow you to take that HDMI signal and send it out to your home theater and to the surround sound processor in the home theater to get your 7.1 audio. But because the HDMI signal goes into this surround sound processor card, we down mix it to two channel and then we pass it along to what we call our Sonex system. And our Sonex system is a audio distribution system that takes in up to 24 sources, analog and some digital and then sends it out in this particular unit you're looking at right here it sends it out to eight zones or eight different rooms at 140 watts per channel per room um, wow. and so you send out you send out amplified audio so that the speakers at the end don't need an amplifier at the local end 
Exactly. So the Sonics uh, solution takes in anal stereo analog audio, uh, SPDIF digital uh, audio, where the digital media sig uh, pr product takes in, say, HDMI or any type of video, multi-channel audio, down mixes it, sends it into the Sonic system. The Sonic system then distributes it as an amplified signal through traditional speaker wires out to your in ceiling, your in walls, uh, floor standing speakers, whatever whatever you might have. Uh, mm -hmm. That way, you can have zones of video that don't necessarily uh, uh, require a surround sound receiver, a theater product like that. That I can have nice, high quality two zone or, or stereo audio along with that high high definition uh, display. And then I'll have theater zones, media room zones that will be taken care of completely by digital media where I'll have the high-definition video signal and the 7.1 or whatever, 5.1 uh, a surround sound audio that goes along with it. So you really mm -hmm. get the best of both worlds since digital media will downmix uh, um, automatically while maintaining the 7.1 signal for other rooms. Now, I'm curious about sending speaker-level signals from a central location where the Sonics box might be versus sending line level um, or digital uh, to a remote local amp near the speakers. Uh, I've always That's, thought that sen sending speaker level over long distances was often not a good idea. Well, that's 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 a good point. Is that uh, and the, one of the things that's uh, unique about the Sonics product is that that each eight zone module um, really distributes the audio through speaker level to the local rooms near that product, and then we have our Sonics bus, which um, utilizes uh, shielded twisted pair Cat six type wiring, mm -hmm. and I can go and remotely put zones out on that Sonex bus network. So I can put another eight zones of uh, amplified uh, uh, audio distribution, maybe in a different wing of the house or a different floor of the house, so that each of my speaker line runs uh, it, we, is maintained fairly locally, so I don't have those, those losses that you're probably referring to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, uh, sounds like zones, of course, that would be a little too small for yeah. Crestron land. So uh, Sonex <laughs> actually gives you um, eight outputs, which gets you up to 72 zones, um, and you can distribute that throughout the house if you're going out to a pool house or something else. Um, mm -hmm. We can even extend that by fiber and go out to one of these uh, remote receiver units and come back in and then go amplifier to, amplify to the speakers locally. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In one of these 60,000 square foot homes, I'm sure that's, uh, that's what you would do there, huh? It's uh, pretty standard, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, you mentioned uh, surround sound processors and uh, and the main theater room, and I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because while Crestron has mostly been involved in audio video distribution and control, recently you guys got involved with uh, uh, preamp processors and and power amps for the home theater and also media uh, source devices as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? You know, it's interesting, before we got online here, I thought you might ask how long we've been making surround sound processors for, so I had to go back and take a look. We've actually been shipping surround processors since uh, 2003, and they were part of that uh, composite S component PVID video solution that we talked about right at the beginning of this program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we distribute SP diff audio and component video to a room, we needed some sort of uh, hardware or appliance grade device to bring it back into multi channel audio to go to an amplifier and then give the integrator full control. So um, sure. we shipped thousands of surround sound processors over the years. And then back in 2007, probably three or four years ago, we introduced a, uh, a product line called Adagio we had an integrated surround sound processor, multi-channel audio distribution system plus control system bundled into one unit. And uh, we sold many thousands of those units as well. So uh, surround sound processing and DSP is not something that's new to us. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, we've been doing it in our commercial product line for many, many years yeah. uh, for the boardroom and conference rooms. But mm -hmm. I think the product that you're referring to is something that we call ProSize. And this was, um, you know, this was really our entry into the high-end surround sound processing, kind of the esoteric uh, world of, uh, of you know bringing you that <laughs> premium quality sound, and so um, Josh can add a little bit more to this side of things. 
Yeah, so ProSize is, is really made up of, of, of two primary components. First, the, the surround sound preamplifier, and then secondarily, one of two uh, amplifier choices. We have a, a, a seven-channel amplifier. We have, actually have two seven-channel amplifiers. Uh, one is 400 watts a channel into 8 ohms, 700 watts a channel into 4 ohms, and the other one is uh, 250 into 8, and then I forget the exact number into uh, 4 ohms. Still quite significant. Um, and then the uh, preamp product uh, is, is a little bit unique. Um, you know, really the, the goal of any high-end audio system is to uh, be able to take in the signal from whatever source it is, bring it in, and, and today pretty much everything gets digitized, so you have to have the, the best uh, A to Ds that are on the market today, the best DACs that are on the market today. Uh, your signal-to-noise ratio has to be through the roof. Ours is, is greater than 130 dB through the DACs. Um, so it, it really has to be uh, a system that can pass the signal from one point to the other out to the amplifier as absolutely as cleanly as possible. And that's what we, what we really strove to do in this ProSize line. Uh, we do that by bringing it in. Uh, we, we interconnect the, the preamp and the amplifier through high quality balanced uh, uh, signaling types. Um, and you know, we support pretty much every type of input on that preamp that, that you're going to want. You're going to have your analog audio, both balanced and unbalanced, SPDIF, TOS, even have AES, EBU, and your, your HDMI, which is going to get you uh, all your, your high-definition audio signals from things like Blu-ray players and satellite receivers and, and, and whatnot. And, and from there... Um, you know, audio really is is very personal, and that's uh, that's where this product it really shines. Is we have the ability within that that audio product to go in and have it automatically EQ to your room environment. Uh, if you're an audiophile and, and you have the tool set to do so, you can go in and utilize graphic and parametric EQs to uh, to uh, to tweak this to your personal taste. Um, and, and even things that are a little more esoteric, like uh, we, it's actually a 7.3 processor, so we have multiple subwoofer outputs um, that you can distribute subwoofers around the room that is going to compensate for room anomalies like room mode cancellations and things along those lines. So now, why, really, why did you choose why did you choose three subs instead of four, for example, or two? Well, it's 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 really a, a number of different uh, uh, variables. Uh, you know, the more subs that you put put in the room. Um, the, the more uh, room modes that you're physically going to excite and the, the less chance you're going to have to have high peaks or nulls somewhere in the space. Um, so in, in this particular scenario, uh, we looked at having, you know, subs in the front, subs in the back, subs, you know, somewhere in the center position as, as, a, as a possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the unique things that we do that, that many other manufacturers uh, haven't done is we actually have separate EQs, delays, level adjustments for every single one of those subwoofer outputs. So the mm. goal is really to make make it seem like it's one subwoofer in that in that room space, even though that you have multiple multiples that are distributed around the room. Right. I, I'm sure you guys must be familiar with Floyd Tool's work on subwoofer placement and how uh, multiple subs placed properly can, in fact, minimize uh, room modes and and such. Exactly. That's that's one of the the reasons and rationales behind uh, that that process. Um, you know, but in, in the end, in the end, you, you can only do so much in the in the DSP, and uh, and, and we try to do as much there as possible. But as you know, uh, if you don't if you don't look at the room first and and, and treat the room and and do mm -hmm. things like that, uh, a lot of it is all for naught. Exactly right. In fact, uh, I always try to get the room and the speaker placement as as good as it can be before starting to apply DSP, which means that minimizes the actual use of DSP, which I think is, in my opinion, is the, the best approach. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then you're just, you're really using the DSP more for, for your personal taste. Um, mm -hmm. More than anything, you know, everybody's got, you know, you look at things like graphic EQs and you walk into, into somebody's, you know, home many years ago when you saw graphic EQs uh, that were still sliders. Um, yeah. and, and, and you walk into one room and, and somebody really took the time to, to flatten the, the response out. And you can pretty much look at it and tell that. And then you walk into 90% of the other rooms and you have the smiley face. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> so it really is, it is personal. You still have people out there that are, that are telling you that uh, you know you can tell the difference between a hundred and fifty dollars speaker cable and a thousand dollars speaker cable. So uh, right. you know, do you dispute it's, it's, that? 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I do. <laughs> uh, you, you have half a million dollars worth of audio test equipment that can't hear the difference, but somehow uh, the, the human ear can. Uh, yeah, I, well, th I, this, is a, this is a great debate that I actually love to get into with as many people as I can, because there are as many people as there are with an opinion. There are different opinions about it. Absolutely. Uh, before we run out of time, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you. Uh, I believe Crestron recently introduced uh, a media server. Is that ADMS? That's right. Yep, we introduced a digital media server, and um, the concept behind this whole thing really came out of the frustration in the home, which was that there were so many uh, sources today for media that it was really hard to collect them uh, together. And so, uh, and I'll give you an example. I was actually home with my daughter a few years ago, and she wanted to watch Harry Potter. And of course, I had a multi-disc uh, DVD changer at the time. I had on-demand cable. Uh, I even had a, a box called a Voodoo box at the time. And, uh, and Voodoo. Voodoo so is I still here, obviously. Yeah, Voodoo's here. They just don't make it as a separate box. And uh, But I had the separate box, one of the early ones, and, you know, she came to me and asked me if she could watch Harry Potter, and I thought, of course, no problem. <laughs> and um, 15 minutes later, I found myself searching through my, uh, my DVD library, the on-demand, even through the Voodoo, and, you know, she kind of looked at me, uh, you know, all of 10 years old <laughs> with a sense of frustration and, and uh, said, see you later. I'm going to do something fun. And uh, I sat there <laughs> saying, my gosh, I, could, I couldn't even find this media. So the concept behind our, our media server was that we wanted to be able to bring these disparate forms of media together, allow you an easy search engine um, to go out and look at some of the different online content providers, plus your local uh, DVD and Blu-ray library, uh, and even anything that you have on your network attached storage drive, and bring that together at your fingertips and allow you to, to see it in the, in the family room or the theater. And so, uh, and so that's what we've done. So is this a computer-based system? It's like a, a Windows computer that's, that's putting this all together? Or, or what's, this, what's the infrastructure there? It is, but um, it's an appliance-grade PC. We spent a lot of time uh, fabricating the hardware on there to, you know, it's not just your standard PC shoved inside of uh, an enclosure. Um, we also work directly with Microsoft for a long time um, to lock down the system. And, uh, you know, we went with the Microsoft-based system because of uh, all the encryption and DRM yeah. capabilities that we needed to be able to handle. So, uh, so it's, it's been a very good success for us, but it continues to progress. It's, it's one of those products where once you release it, you know, you still have to have a team of engineers to continue to add on features, uh, take in and ingest new content. And, uh, and the nice thing about it is, is that we can push this content out to our customers who purchase the unit. Now, does it uh, does it have a Blu-ray player integrated into it, or does it access uh, an outboard Blu-ray player? How do you get Blu-ray content, for example? Can you import Blu-ray content into uh, onto a hard disk, which I would think probably not legally anyway? Um, well, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, we do a model that has an internal Blu-ray player. We also have a 200-disc, uh, and now we actually have a 400-disc yeah. Blu-ray changer um, that complements the system, and you can add up to four 400-disc Blu-ray changers onto the system. Uh, and then if, if some people find a way to get content onto uh, a hard drive, we can certainly play that back. We have all the provisions inside the box, but we don't, we don't provide them with the opportunity to, to do that. <laughs> to rip the Blu-rays onto a hard drive, huh? That's yeah. right. There's certain legal challenges with that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, in the last couple of minutes, I, I, there's one other area I wanted to touch on. It gets back to the uh, area of control. And I, I know that Crestron's been long involved in RS-232 control, which is typical in larger, more extensive, more expensive type of systems. Uh, do you also use infrared, uh, radio frequency, Bluetooth? Are, are all of these options uh, with Crestron systems? Um, yeah, again, again there, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, you know, we've made our living on taking disparate types of uh, devices and linking them together no matter how they're controlled. So infrared and RS-232, you know, uh, probably are still the, the most popular yeah. forms of control. Um, however, we're seeing more and more devices are Ethernet-based or TCP IP-based control. So, for example, that Voodoo box that I talked about even a few years ago, uh, it wasn't even introduced with any infrared control. It was uh, strictly a proprietary RF control or Ethernet-based control. So, um, 
we have uh, we have mastered certainly network based control, and we're seeing more and more devices go that way. Um, but then, as far as other devices coming out, you know, we're seeing we're starting to see some other technologies as far as wireless become popular. Yeah. Um, probably four or five years ago, we introduced uh, and we were one of the, um, the leaders in development for what's called Zigbee today, and that's mesh network technology. And so we have a lot of products that ship. We've shipped hundreds of thousands of uh, lighting products that are, are um, mesh network based. We actually call it Infinet, now Infinet EX, we're in our second generation. And um, mesh, I'm called, sorry, define mesh network. I don't remember what that stands for. Um, a mesh network is a concept where every device, let's say a light switch inside of a wall, is not, a, not only able to receive control signals by RF, uh, but it's able to transmit back its status over RF and incorporate into that is a repeater. So mm -hmm. every one of these devices that go in your home uh, form a network, and the more devices you have in the home, actually the better network coverage that you get. So the nice thing about this technology is you can put in light switches, you can put in thermostats, uh, and then we also make handheld remote controls, which now instead of having to install a Wi-Fi network throughout your home and, and make sure that you have the proper coverage, the more of these devices you install, the better your network is, and uh, it really makes for a, a really nice network. Ah, understood. And that, of course, also brings us to the fact that your systems can not only control audio-video distribution, but lighting, the uh, climate system, security systems all that kind of stuff. And, and I think what you're saying basically is if you have these mesh network devices, light switches and so on throughout your house, it's essentially giving you uh, even overall coverage throughout your house, wherever these things are. That's right. It's, it's really nice. And, you know, I will tell you, we've been doing, as I said, Josh and I have been doing home control for uh, forever. And uh, I will <laughs> say even above audio and video, the, um, you know, it's a lifestyle thing. If you go into a home, even a three or 4,000 square foot home, if you count the number of light switches that you have, and if you have kids, I think we all know about the fact that you go to sleep at night and you got to walk around the house and turn the lights off. Um, you know, just the fact to have a, a lighting system in the home, and if you look at our Prodigy line, the prices have come down significantly, makes it much more affordable, gives you uh, energy savings, and you know what, it's a peace of mind. I mean, I know I travel a fair amount, and my wife really enjoys the fact that if she hears a noise downstairs, she presses one button and all the lights go on it certainly would scare the heck out of me if i was breaking into somebody's house <laughs> so um so that and thermostat control uh, you know i really feel like those are some of the fundamentals of where everything is heading today you know of what people just expect today with the electronic lifestyle mm -hmm. and so uh, we're doing our best to make these things a lot more affordable um to allow people to start out with some environmental control and then you know what if you want to add some av to it Heck, go for it. We have that, too. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Fred uh, and Josh, I want to thank you so much for being on the program. It's been very informative, and uh, I have sure enjoyed myself. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate having us. It was a pleasure. You bet. Uh, you can uh, get all the scoop on Crestron uh, products uh, of all the types we've been talking about at Crestron.com. My online homes, of course, are UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheater.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv and follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Twit is off next week for President's Day, but we'll be back in two weeks when my guest geek is scheduled to be J.J. Johnston, chief scientist at DTS, to talk all about audio formats, which he's been working on for many, many years. So I'm really looking forward to that, and I sure hope you'll join me. Until then, geek out. Geek out.